Hi, Pedro. Thank you so much for making time for this conversation. I've been looking forward to it all week. And um, Thank you very much. for me, it's, it's, a, it's really an honor to, to have this opportunity to talk to you because um, I see you personally as one of those um, free radicals. You know, a free radical in a, in a chemical reaction um, is a small, very small molecule, but it's, it creates chain reactions and transforms the, the wider context. And, and when, when I, from what I know about your work in so many different areas, you've been, um, as you just said, when we had a quick, quick conversation before this, like you always work in networks and you always work in collaboration with others, but through that collaborative attitude, you've, you've achieved a huge amount with others. And um, so thank you so much for, for, for this opportunity. And I normally start with, um, inviting people to tell a little bit about their story. Um, what, what called you to do this work and how did you start off in, in all this? Well, thank you very much, Daniel. What a, what a gift. Um, every time I have to respond to that question, it leads me to, to the essence. And uh, I know I'm a, entrepreneur by nature got no idea why it happened when i was very young and adolescent you know with school kids we started uh, uh, a movement a youth movement uh, basically music for youth and uh, and the, the the raison d'etre of that movement was to basically listen to mis uh, to music but integrating kids from public and private schools. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was way back. I mean, that was when I was 14, 15, 17. And it, you know, Music for Youth in Buenos Aires has already celebrated its 50th anniversary. So, um, by the way, we had Daniel Barenboim at the main avenue uh, conducting the Berlin Philharmonia. Wow. So, to celebrate the, the movement. But anyway, um, um, so, so that's me by nature. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately for my own life and my society, um, you know, we went through dictatorships. And um, in my case, it affected many of my most dearest friends. Um, many of them were active participants of the church movements. And uh, of parishes, and um, and some actually got into the guerrilla movements. But I was a friend, you see. So uh, and and we coincided in the kind of vision we had for more equality, and and in those times for more participation. And um, but it happened to be that uh, some went through violence, and some stayed more in the peaceful, you know, parts. In my case, I was much more engaged with the peace, the, 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 the latter, but my best friend, Roberto Van Kelderen, um, he, he was, he decided to go for this other path. And, um, and I was sure that he was going to disappear, which was the case in Argentina. People were not executed formally. They didn't go through a trial. They were basically disappeared, right? And uh, over 30,000 uh, people disappeared, right? So, um, so the night before, I was completely convinced that that was going to be the last day I was going to see him. There was no chance that, I, that he could sleep at his parents' place. So I just told him, come over to my place. You know, automatically. And that was the moment that we actually had the most, I had my most profound conversation in life. And uh, I asked him to, to do his best to leave the country, that everything was organized the next day to help him leave the country. And he said, no way. He said, if I do that, I will not be consistent with my values, my vision of change, and 
um, everything that I've said until now, um, will not have any more, um, like, you know, the, the, the strength of the language and, 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 and the, and the value propositions. So what happened was that I said, well, um, what can I do for you? And he said two things, tell everybody that I never killed anyone. And two, um, uh, well, basically, um, do everything that you can to be consistent with what you think the world should be. Yeah. So, and the next day, my mom had prepared the most extraordinary breakfast for him. And we just said, you know, I, I went to the, to the elevator and said, well, basically, until next life. And that was it. So that was my most profound conversation, essential conversation, that after that, he disappeared. But then um, I went down to Patagonia just in case. And there was a huge snowstorm. And I, I always understood that snow, uh, that snow storm as like my protection. And after three weeks of snow, you know, when we all know what happens, the sun start, starts shining and you start seeing, you know, the brightness. And I felt the feeling of the opportunity and of hope. But it was the moment that I didn't know what to do in my life. I had just graduated from law school, both of us. Uh, both of us had graduated and when I graduated I didn't know what to do you know because I needed to be consistent with what the law tells you to do and uh, so so basically I started during those years this is 1977 started wondering well who's going to be protecting the beauty of this perfection that I'm witnessing of nature with human beings and that was the most incipient sense of an inner call that I had to devote my, my life to integrate the earth into everything else. So, and that during those times, it led me to study environmental law and policy actually abroad and, and comparative uh, policies and law. And then when I returned back to democracy in Argentina in 1982, we started an organization, a local organization, but with a Latin American commitment and engagement. So everything that we would do would have to create value for the region. So during those times, my personal uh, identity was very much a Latin American. And Coming this, from this was, the, this was the Fundación de um, Ambiente y Recursos Nat Naturales. That's right. It's um, uh, the Environment and Natural Resources Foundation that we started with a, a very prestigious uh, uh, expert on natural resources law. And, and then from then on, we started doing, you know, the kind of uh, things that actually you know, moved me and, 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 and I was passionate about, which was to connect uh, the three axes, you know, access to justice, access to decision making and access to information to environmental rights. So that was actually promoted into the different national constitutions in different Latin American countries. And also practicing, you know, the only way that you can promote an idea is that once you have the tool, that makes that idea tangible and material. So uh, that's basically that period of my time that, um, that well, uh, and then from that institutional basis, we worked on different environmental regimes. It was that generation of, of, of environmental awareness throughout the region 
and uh, using new mechanisms of law and policy, but always practicing them. And also, you know, participating in the process towards the Earth Summit on mm. Environment but and Development. I, I want to come to that in a sec, just, just so I understand the, the remit of the foundation a bit better. It was focused on helping um, changes in policy and law um, across Latin America to include the, the conversation about environmental protection and wise resource use in, in, the, in the legal system or? Right, during those times, and also the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because on the one hand, you have, you know, the regimes, the regimes for, say, forest con conservation, national, national parks, or, or con you know, uh, species conservation, or water quality or air pollution you have these like segments we were all organized by segments during those times yeah. you see i mean we all come <laughs> at least i come from that you know the logic of here is the environment and here's you know social development and here is the economy i i hadn't integrated anything although intuitively that was what i wanted you see but i didn't know how to do it so i would just focus on you know, very concrete, lineal responses to, to concrete problems, you see? So, and, and my responses, always done with others, was, uh, you know, through legal uh, instruments and regimes. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them, like, you know, the, the three, the three pr the principles of access, you know, access to justice, access to information, and access to uh, decision-making, we knew at least that, anyone would like to use them for their own purposes so gradually we started interacting with movements that had other causes like you know poverty uh, uh, gender equality and, and and you know indigenous rights and and gradually we started noticing that they really liked the idea of using exactly the same mechanisms that were being in, institutionalized and implemented because of environmental aims, you see? So, so it was very interesting. And that led me, of course, personally, to start empathizing with the causes of others because these were all beautiful people. They were all, you know, fighting for, for you know, a better world. Uh, but I had no clue. And during those times, I was very much a professional. You know, I had a discipline myself self-security as a individual was to know about the content of a discipline i knew the scope of the discipline i would specialize i would you know i would build my professional prestige and reputation based on my knowledge and i would read books and i would write that was me during those times and um and i was you know, I was recognized by others and people would, would call me in, people would pay for me and, and so on. And so you, th th that then probably led to you being invited to um, pulling together the, the Latin American um, collaboration in preparation for the Earth Summit in Rio. Well, let's put it this way. You know, again, uh, the, the person with whom we worked, you know, we had co-founded the Fundación Ambiente y Recursos Naturales, and myself, by nature, both of us are entrepreneurs. So it's not, we, we were not invited formally at the beginning, but we started proposing the activity. So we started actually coming up with initiatives and we started clustering the different alliances it, from Mexico all the way down to Chile and Argentina, which was, a civil society initiative. We were not called by the UN, for example. Mm -hmm. But once you start doing that, as we all know, once you start calling all the parties, uh, then the and also the governments, the local governments, the national governments, then of course the next, you know, the next uh, uh, grouping are the intergovernmental organizations. So we start, you know, working with them. So with a Brundtland Commission with um, well, with the UN Secretariat for the Earth Summit, uh, there was a man called Maurice Strong, and the person who was in charge of of uh, the, the, the relationships 
of the UN summit with civil society was Yolanda Cacabatzi. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had been formerly the, uh, the founder of the Natura Foundation in Ecuador. And she was part of this process, you see. And, and then she was named the UN Undersecretary for the Relationships with Civil Society. So, so it, was natu it was like a natural evolution because we started to work on the preparations, uh, well, way back. I can't remember exactly the, the, the date, but I would say like three years before. You know, preparing, preparing, you know, uh, preparing journalism, preparing NGOs, preparing the different sectors, labor union, business, uh, government, you know, preparing the conversations. And, and, and there was, uh, our, there was like a report which was called Our Common Future. I know this is, you know, old history. Yeah, and, uh, history. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so we started participating in, you know, with, with contributions and, and, and uh, yeah, trillions of initiatives, which were, you know, catalyzed by, by this process. It wasn't the only process, you see, and, and this, was, this is very important to say. It was one of the civil society processes that fed into the Earth Summit, mm. you see, I so. I, I met Maurice and Hannah a number of times because they, particularly Hannah Strong, was also quite involved in helping to start or what was one of the founding members of the Global Eco Village Network, and, yeah. and those conversations. And um, I've often often wondered because Maurice uh, put a lot of money into helping to organize the Rio ninety two summit. But but how how did he, what was his role actually in in no. orchestrating? Well, he was the secretary of the conference. He was the general secretary of the entire conference. So it was a process and the, the, the celebration of the, of the process. And, um, oh, there's so many names that suddenly start popping out. Um, yeah, there was a, there was a, a group in, in Geneva that I'm trying to recall the name of, of the chap who passed away. Anyway, um, uh, I mean, we we had the support of different governments. We had the support of uh, Scandinavian governments, in fact, plus the Netherlands, and uh, and then the I, the Inter American Development Bank. Um, so we we had like a very strong support of you know the Brazilian government, the then the, the then Brazilian government, and uh, so so everything sort of you know was a good flow. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was a good experience. But that experience in my personal journey led me definitely to start saying, you know, I need to go beyond the discipline and beyond the sector. You know, I'm not, I'm not a person that I can fit in my own borders. <laughs> so, so I realized that I had to go beyond. And uh, it was then that uh, we met with, with the founder of the Avina Foundation. Stefan Schmidheini, the mm -hmm. Swiss philanthropist. And we had the, again, like one of my most amazing conversations in my life. Understanding the, you know, the, the reason for which he was creating uh, the foundation, which was very simple. He would say, you know, the, the, the direction, the course on which we are will actually make humanity you know crash into the iceberg yeah so he wrote a book called changing course mm -hmm. and he said we do have the opportunity to change the course we're still on time i'm i'm, I'm speaking about 1996 yeah now and he said however nobody knows how to now the collective intelligence definitely surely will know and the way to do that is identifying leadership from any domain, any field. So that's how we need to actually approach it. It's not me, the philanthropist, that will know what to do. It's not the organization, Avina, that will know what to do. Leadership in their interaction with the lenses of sustainability, long-term goals, you know, 
uh, commitment with lots of people, creativity, innovations towards the towards sustainability during those terms, sustainable development in general. And that's what we need to do. So the purpose of Avina, the founding purpose of Avina was to identify leadership from any any sector, any grouping, from the poverty, from the wealth, from business, from any kind of NGO, from wherever, you see? Identify them and see if we can match with them and make a partnership and then connect them for collective action. So I was, I was completely, you know, blown out with this new opportunity because it matched exactly with what was happening to me. And it was the moment that I started, you know, like uh, yeah, peeling you... off my, 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 my older skin, you see, mm -hmm. my discipline. The caterpillar and... turned into a butterfly and you've been right. doing that, exactly that ever since with lots of different initiatives. Uh, exactly. And it... that was amazing. I, just because we're talking about Sh uh, Stefan Schmidt Heine and um, and there, I have a connection somehow to his story because he also spent a good part of his life here on Mallorca and still owns a large property on Mallorca, and then he had to kind of uh, go to Latin America for legal reasons um, for for a while, and the the whole story of his life of of inheriting a huge amount of money and and leadership of a large company that um, has probably created one of the most environmentally of, of to human health mo most toxic products that that caused in, like a huge amount of deaths. Uh, I personally lost a friend to asbestosis. Um, how, like if you knew him personally, um, how was, how did that affect him? Because I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a huge karma to live with, to on the one hand have all this wealth, but to, to know that I mean, no, nobody in his family tried to kill people. They, they they just didn't know about the effects of this this product. But nevertheless, all that wealth that that he inherited was somehow generated by asbestos. And um, yeah. how 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 did he li live, or how does he live, with this this tension of on the one? I mean, he's done enabled wonderful things through Avina and other other things. He's been a very active philanthropist. Um, but it must be just a very difficult thing to live with. Well, that same conversation that we had in 1996, again, very, very profound, he brought up the issue to me, like saying, well, you know, telling me about his own personal story, like saying, and, and this is my interpretation of what, how I was perceiving him at that moment, right? And he said to me, you know, my parents, you know, basically uh, anticipated the inheritance when I was, I think he was 37 mm -hmm. and uh, a kid with all kinds of dreams for a better world. Um, and suddenly I, I read a, uh, an article I'm not sure in which, you know, like science or one of those journals about asbestos. And I became aware that I could become a mass criminal, right? So his decision was to find a solution, an alternative. And he was the man who actually came up with the alternative technologies and became an activist to ban asbestos mm. wow. and that of course he went to the board of the company with a plan which was not accepted so he said i need to i need to go i need to leave because i can't be coherent with my values and my vision of the world i want with this with this in with this uh what i have inherited so that's when he started to sell his part. You see, gradually, it's a huge, it was a huge, huge conglomerate. So, and I think that the fact that he was so open about his activism against uh, asbestos and creating, of course, all the mechanisms for compensation that he could think of in the different parts of 
where the company was. I think that has been one of the grounds of why he can be legally accused because he knew, although there was no legislation against uh, asbestos, all the factories were legally authorized. And uh, he was, I mean, the company was operating under a legal, you know, uh, legal uh, confirmation. I mean, everything was okay from a legal standpoint. Compliance, yeah. Compliance, exactly. Yeah. And the World Health Organization had still during those times, you know, asbestos as uh, authorized substance. Mm. So it's, but we all know that legally speaking, even if you are legally authorized and all the science says it's fine, if you acknowledge that it's not fine, that's one of the legal grounds for accusations. That's interesting because I, I often wondered what was the, the actual legal loophole that, that put him into this position where, because he was also doing very good work here on Mallorca and supporting a lot of European activities in, in sure. the environmental area. But then there was this time when, when he literally had to flee um, Europe in order not to get um, incarcerated. Yeah. Well, he actually did not flee from Europe. He actually lives in Switzerland and the Swiss government uh, uh, actually understands his case and protects him legally. So, um, but this is one of the cases that if succeeds, it will be a terrible case for other business people in the world that suddenly realize that what they're doing is not good for the planet and for people. If they actually become activists of the change of their own, you know, uh, yeah, their own try, company. Try to make amends of their own mistakes that they did. Right. They didn't know. Um, they become illegally exactly. persecuted. So what happened to me when I listened to, to him? I think I was even more moved by him because someone who can be that level of humbleness, you know, and, 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 and completely dedicated to do his part actually moved me very, very strongly. It's and that was the moment that we built trust, the kind of trust that he said, would you like to accompany me to start the Avena Foundation in Latin America? I said, of course. I mean, it was like a dream that I was, I mean, I couldn't believe that this was true. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't only the opportunity that I received from Stefan, but his wisdom. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've understood so much of reality just being with him. But I also understood by him the importance or the potential agent of change that could be business. Mm -hmm. I, I'm speaking, you know, in 1996, all right? Not, during those times, it wasn't, I mean, I, I, I didn't buy into corporate social responsibility, you see? I just couldn't mm. because I could sense something else during those times. Of course, there's all kinds of businesses. But what I did understand was the potential of business leadership. Business leadership, not only implementing that leadership for change within the companies, but to take that example to the world and show it was my very first moment in life that I had a grasp of a intuition that perhaps markets, the market dynamics could change if business would evolve through their leadership. Of course, at the beginning, during those times, I was still with the idea of individual leaders you know, I could see someone like Stefan as my leader, you see. But of course, then I started, you know, evolving towards collective leadership, thanks to the practice in Avina. Mm -hmm. And then gradually you start, you know, then you start evolving. And, and, and today I would say that every human being could be a leader, a leader bringing their, you know, singular, singular originality to the world. And then you expand that. And that's why I feel that we need 
an economy and a politics that enables people to expand in and flourish into all of their dimensions. Mm -hmm. And whenever I see someone, you know, constrained from being a leader for society, regardless their ideas, regardless their context, then I feel the entire society is missing an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the planet as well, because humans are part of, you know, resonating, uh, living beings uh, of life. So, so when, when you help to set up Arena for Latin America and then in different Latin American countries, from, from there on, did Arena just enable lots of environmental projects, environmental protection projects through funding? Or what, what was the, the modus no. operandi? Um, no, it wasn't. I mean, no, no, no. Uh, Avina was not only about environmental. Mm -hmm. It was social. It was uh, human rights. It was any domain of leadership. Mm -hmm. See? And it was basically trying to connect all the dimensions. What we <laughs> refer to as the uh, triple impact value creation. Mm -hmm. During those times, we would say intersectorial, you know, we would say sustainable development. Uh, but sustainable development in Latin America was not associated and narrowed down only to the environment. Mm -hmm. Sustainable development in our language was mostly uh, the integration. Our language and our vision in Latin America in general was the integration of all the dimensions in whatever you would do. You see, so it was social, environmental, and economically sustainable. And, uh, and, and politically sustainable as well, you know, and culturally sustainable. It was the, in, you know, that's very unique, I would say, of the Latin American uh, cosmovision. Um, and that's very present. So, so, and how would you achieve that? If you were an environmental leader and you would need a social leader, the interaction would actually be based on the mutual admiration of leadership, of commitment and engagement, and then you start cooperating, and then you start integrating by people to people. Mm -hmm. You see, so um, uh, so that was the logic, the dynamics of Avina. So and is, uh, is that also why? Because when when you started to work with others on creating Sistema B, um, you you already understood that B corporations by themselves only as a few companies trying to do things a little bit better or even um, improving um, wasn't wasn't going to cut it and because okay. the, how, how would you distinguish how because in, in Europe we don't really have like there's a pretty strong B Corp movement but um, the systemic approach apart from a few grassroots landing points like Nessie in, in, in Spain um, hasn't really landed yet. The, the, the vision that I understand you hold with Sistema B to work with lawyers, to work in policy, to work with business, to work with civil society, to, to literally create the human connections, that human mutual co recognition you just spoke about, that should business as usual fail, which we both know it will it already is that there is a an infrastructure of predominantly human relationships and trust that can buffer the collapse of a system that no longer serves. Is is, is that right? Yeah. That that's the well, it's, it's very correct. Um, although what happened was that 2009 was a very uh, uh, very significant year for me because I was in in Stockholm. Uh, and I heard for the first time <clears throat> from Johan uh, Rockström. Rockström. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, at the Stockholm uh, Resilience Center, uh, the state of health of the earth, of the planet. And for the first time in my life, I heard the notion of ecosystem planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I was sitting down and suddenly had, it was an aha moment. 
So I looked back to see if others were having the same feeling, <laughs> if I was the only one. Yeah. And I scored it for a big you know, period of time, a, a moment of anguish of not knowing what to do. Because I started realizing the scale of the problem in which we were. That same year was COP, uh, uh, COP uh, 15. Uh, South and Africa. So, in, in, in Copenhagen. Uh, Cop so I, yeah, uh, that yeah. was a disaster, yeah. Oof. So I went to Copenhagen, and of course I saw, well, there were many things that happened, and, and I noticed how the delegations were each of them protecting their national interests. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I could see, because I knew some of the private business sectors, you know, interacting with the national delegations. And I started feeling, well, where are we going to speak about the common general good for humanity and the planet in this conversation? This is something about negotiating who's going to be seeding, uh, confronted with whom, China, the US, India. Uh, anyway, I started feeling the lack of a space that would give me the trust to say, this is what we work for the common good of all humanity and the planet. And for a few years, or a few months, I would say, for a year, more or less, I started sensing the lack of a space where I would feel, if I do this, it's going to be contributing to a solution. And uh, so that was when I started my own second crisis of, you know, of lifetime. Not that I had a problem with Avina, but I suddenly felt Avina is not enough. Then suddenly I realized, you know, another aha moment, business is the most numerous of all human organizations after family. And the most numerous of everyday decisions are of commercial nature. So I had this flash. And so, and at that moment, Alex Pryor, who was one of the founders, actually the founding, found, the, the, the inspirational founder of Guayaki, the Yerba Mate beverage, energy drink beverage, um, approached to me and he said, let's talk about Guayaki. And let's talk about, you know, our aim and how we want to achieve that aim of regenerating the forest and the sense of communities that dwell in those southern Atlantic forests in Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay, and that we couldn't achieve it in a financially sustainable manner through the market. So it was a market-driven solution. So I started experiencing that. And I decided to become a small shareholder. With that act, I started experiencing a journey of one company. So immediately, I started calling to my friends all over South America, like saying, hey, do you know of other companies that do similar stuff? You know, others that do regeneration. Regeneration was my response to the trespassing of ecosystem planetary boundaries. And, 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 so, so that was my lineal thinking, you see? So as it went away, what do we do so it comes back and people can still be there and, and, and flourish there? So that was my interconnection, if you want. When I started calling uh, my friends, I called basically friends from Chile, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, and I started noticing that perhaps very few, some few, companies had exactly the same goal as, as Guayaki, regeneration of deserts, uh, other, other forests, but in Brazil. And, but in Chile, they didn't have the same kind of companies with that same goal. I'm speaking about my, uh, 2010 and 2000, uh, early 2011, right? But in Chile, a very close friend of mine, Maria Emilia Correa, said, I don't know of any company that wants regeneration, 
but I'm starting to see other companies that have converted a societal need into their purpose, into their business purpose, and their new core business, you see, and they're taking that purpose to every single act, like how they source their, the, you know, with their supplies, how they sell, how they attract investors, how they attract collaborators. This is very new what we're, what we're observing. So, and she said, well, we might start something new, right? I said, let's start something. And I was actually lecturing, you know, once you start becoming passionate about a new vision, you know, you're still developing it, you start sharing that. Yeah. So, you know, I started sharing this in different, you know, presentations and lectures. I was in a university in Buenos Aires, in the Vitela University. And someone from the audience said, but this is already existing in my country. And that was the US. The B Corps. Yes, and yeah. they're called the B Corps. Yeah. And that was at seven o'clock in the afternoon. And this is quite relevant. So I immediately went to talk to this man after the lecture. And I said, do you know more about this? And he said, yes, I know the founders. I know the creators. And, and I said, can we meet with them? Well, that night I went out with people. I went back home. And the first thing I did was to write the mail to Maria Emilia Correa. Mm -hmm. And that the moment I did the click, I received a mail from Maria Emilia Correa with the same link about B Lab and B Corp. <laughs> like saying, we need to meet these people. I said, I've just met, I now know how to do that. It was that moment. And so three months, we started conversations with the founders of B-Lab and the creators of B the B-Corps. And I always say, you know, the moment of co-creation is the most sacred moment that comes from multiple, multiple energies and knowledge and, and, and experiences. And they suddenly become crystallized in a new innovation. And that's why I always celebrate the three founders of, of B Lab, uh, Bart Houlihan, Jay Cohen, and, 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 and uh, Andrew Kasoy. I always celebrate them because thanks to that, we we're able to expand the systems approach. We went to New York, we fell in love with them, four Latin Americans and the three US Americans. We just became like soul brothers and sisters. And we said, we're going to make it. But when we got back to Latin America, that those following two months, we decided that we were going to create what we call system B, not system A, but system B. Why? Because in Latin America, we had a concept of polarization of lots of divisions, left, right, poor, rich, who are the ones to blame and who are the good guys? And we thought we need to create a new safe space to engage people from all avenues and where we are not stuck with the wording. In fact, the name Sistema B comes because of our, our lack of intelligence and inspiration to put a name of what kind of system we wanted. Because every word that we found had the Triggers. baggage yeah. of a historical conflict. Mm -hmm. And we said, no more, let's put B. And if it doesn't work, eventually it'll become C, you see? But we needed something, you know, that would invite everybody to a safe space. And that's the reason for which we thought everywhere where we start system B has to start with concrete, you know, examples of B Corps becoming, sorry, companies becoming B Corps because it's a very concrete way to prove that business can actually be part of, you know, large scale solutions. And so that's, I would say that's a pillar. That's the, the pillar of any system B. And I say any system B because today you have uh, 10 national system Bs and then you have one, which is system B international. And then you have local B communities at, that can be provincial or state, the level or can be city wise. So that's why 
that's that's the logic. But everywhere where we start, we start with a B Corp. Because once you have the examples, then you start triggering all the other groups. It's very common for people to say, shouldn't we have the B politicians? Or shouldn't we have the B uh, lawyers? Or shouldn't we have the B educators? I mean, shouldn't we have the B by understanding the B in the vision of what's in the perception has to do with integrated value creation, accountability and transparency in, in, in what value, the way you produce value and how you go beyond the share value and how you go beyond the, the shareholder primacy. So the shareholder priority, if you want, towards like all groupings and all stakeholders to be able to, to balance the interest of all the groups, right? And in the short term and the long term, these elements are appealing to everybody. It's not only appealing to business. And so what we decided to do, sorry, Ben. It, I'm just wondering whether in these national sub chapters of Sistema B, um, are, you start with working with the B Corps in that locality, but then this this opening up towards civil society, towards policymakers, towards law. How how do you do? Are all of those ten national um, system away, um, not just business based, but across all three sectors involving um, civil society, uh, politics, yeah. governance, all that. Yeah, it's very organic. You start with business and events, you know, the first B Corp was the one founded by one of the founders of Sistema B, Gonzalo Muñoz, mm -hmm. you see, Triciclos. Uh, another one was founded by another of the founders, Juan Pablo Larenes. Another one was also co-founded by myself, Emprendia. So Latte was in Chile, Triciclos started in Chile. So, so you know, we, we were the first generation of B Corps in Latin America. And so, so we worked with business. That was our first priority because we believed on the, on business as a force for good. You see, that's very concrete. Now we knew that the lawyers, lawyers and accountants are the, well, basically lawyers are the, because of risk management are the first to be called by the CEOs and by the boards. Right? So we thought, Hey, let's share this with a law firm. Sorry, not with the law firms, with lawyers and the leaders from the law firms. This is a leadership approach. You see, so what happened? What that some of the lawyers started getting passionate about this new opportunity of impact law. So that's how you started to to see the emergence of a now a very strong and very successful network of B lawyers. It's called the Latin American Impact Lawyers Network, right? And working always globally because Citave was born in Chile, but with the global aspiration. I mean, we were suddenly realizing that there was something that we could share with the world. So everything that we would do would have to be uh, valid for anywhere in the world. So that was the systems approach, right? So the, assist, the, the, the six communities, I would say, large, broad communities that has the system being modeled as first the pillar of B Corp, then the large market players. And these are by and large, uh, large companies, very large companies, the governments in the market uh, uh, role and uh, consumer, uh, consumer associations, large consumer associations large chunks of interest there then and 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 as a result of that of that approach for example in this large second uh, category you have large companies walking towards becoming b corps right because the logic is not for all companies to become b corps the logic is for all companies to conduct their business as if they were b corps you see so it's, it's trying to move the market in that direction in creating value and solutions. Also, another example 
so, so now today you have over in Latin America you have over fifteen thousand companies, and you have lots of them experimenting either individually or together the what we call Camino Mahve, uh, which is a program for large companies, and you also have a program for uh, the value chain. So so or initiatives, is, if you will. This is a process of engaging large companies that if they were to try to go through the classic certification process to become a B Corp, they would definitely fail at their current performance. But in order to be able to engage them in yeah. the process of learning, you, you've opened up that, that and right. we'll walk with you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 and of course, you have this first element, which is the purpose how to make purpose a living energy for the entire market, but through the business. The second element has to do with measuring and, and well, evaluate, assessing and measuring your, your impact in different areas. And then the third main element has to do with expanding your fiduciary liability, uh, going beyond the share, share, shareholders, value, uh, shareholders' primacy to all the stakeholder interests what we call today the stakeholder governance, right? Mm -hmm. This is the state, the whole system is the stakeholder governance. Now, with those elements, you still can uh, attract many large companies in the direction, in that direction. I mean, the huge, the largest companies. So, um, but of course, we're very happy when some of these become B Corps, like Natura was for many years, the largest B Corp in the world. Uh, now it's Danone, uh, uh, Danone Way in the U.S., and, and more than 40% of its uh, sales are under the B Corp structure, now, globally speaking. But that, I was just referring to the second, uh, I would say, uh, uh, community of practice. The large companies that they also meet, they help each other, they use the same uh, tools of assessment. Once you use the same tool of assessment, then you start the same kind of conversations about your relationship with the workers, your relationship with the suppliers, with your clients, with the communities, with the, the level of governance that you have, the accountability. And then you start getting these conversations on board in the market, in society, you see? So, so once you have these programs, that's what starts happening. Now, at the same time, you have the governments. Once these get on board, they start realizing that they could also source or they could have a procurement regime uh, that would promote the emergence of this new business identity, this new business uh, uh, sector, if you want. Because if you think about it, it's exactly the same goals of politics are you know, embedded in these companies, in the B Corps. The same higher goals, I would say, the same higher objectives of politics, right? So suddenly you start seeing, hey, we can have large scale solutions through business and the market dynamics. Because once business starts operating this way, then the clients can operate this way. And then the, the suppliers and so on, the investors and the collaborators. So you start driving into this move, you know, many, many other players. Now, and, and the case is that Mendoza was the first city that adopted that regime. But that regime was in inspired Medellin. So now in Latin America, you have two cities that have done the same in terms of uh, developing procurement regimes that uh, not only benefit, but create the market for this kind of business, right? So, so it's what we call high impact business. Right. Is it, I mean, th th this was one of the questions I had for you that, that I certainly find here in Europe, um, like a number of times now I've been invited to um, sort of bus business breakfasts or business lunches to talk about regenerative culture and regenerative development. And, and of course, all these more and more companies are beginning to be very interested in how can I get a piece of regenerative um, and, and become a regenerative company. But my personal sense is that um, there's a sort of glass ceiling of what you can do as a business leader, particularly if you run a publicly listed company. It's different for a Patagonia or, um, or Guayaquil or uh, those companies or Lush or Dr. Bonner um, that are also 
pretty big companies, not as big as these, these giants, but, um, but because they're not shareholder obliged in the same way, they can make decisions much in a much more agile way. But um, like if you look Paul Pullman's path with Unilever, he, he bought up a whole bunch of B Corps as Unilever, um, but eventually he kind of realized that, that he wasn't going to be able to transform Unilever as a whole, and that that I, I sense that as long as the political regulation playing field and also the current conditions of how we set incentives in markets and how we organize our economy um, aren't transformed, there's only so much that that even the largest companies could possibly do, um, and certainly smaller companies. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, although one can still do something yeah. to move in that direction. So those something, for example, the network of lawyers in the case of Brazil has been working, sorry, impact lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. Has been uh, working with another of our communities, the academic community, you know, professors that start observing this and start creating from academics, you know, solutions. And, al and also with um, B Corps and also with com large companies, listed companies like Natura, once you have one case, then you say it's true and it can happen. So Natura is a listed company that has opened up all the answers to all the questionnaire of the B impact assessment. So, so and it's very moving to see how they present themselves as an, with their imperfection, but with their engagement and commitment to improvement and how they start moving ahead on a regular basis and, and and they go through different recertification processes every three years now what happened in, in in brazil is very interesting with the stock market the rules of the stock market and the sao paulo stock market which is a large stock, stock market uh has adopted the, the 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 questionnaire of the b impact assessment for their listed companies it doesn't mean that it, it you're obliged to become a vehicle but once that's why for me it's very important to understand the value of the impact measurement uh, some people think it's only to get a certification you know the brand the b with a with mm -hmm. a circle certified uh benefit corporation but it's not that it's not only that sorry it, it, it changes the way people think. It's, it's, it's exactly what Buckminster Fuller said. Don't tell people what to think. Give them a tool, the use of which will change the way they think. And by exactly. asking people questions, which is why I have 250 questions in my book, um, you, you restructure their thinking. You invite them into whole new connections that they previously didn't have. And so a well-structured exactly. Um, exactly. questionnaire. Exactly. Yeah. So, so just imagine if to, be, to become a listed company in a stock market, you have to ask yourself some questions. It's very simple. And then <laughs> it's very simple. It's, it's, it's witty. And, and, but it's the kind of, you know, it's the kind of conversations that we need, that we normally had outside business. We had it in politics, in academics, in, in civil society, but we didn't have it inside business. So that's why for me that, that tool, the, the B impact assessment tool, um, which is reviewed, you know, on a regular basis as well, and it's always improved and it's always stronger. It, sorry, more strict. That tool is not only useful for the for the certification. It's useful as a management tool that helps management to become much more sustainable in terms of connecting all the dots to become systemic because one of the pillars of sustainability is to become systemic and and you know before we associated um business as the most pragmatic because if you're not pragmatic you don't survive yet we come from the lineal pragmatism how do we evolve from lineal thinking and pragmatism, pragmatism to systemic pragmatism? And, and, and that's something that I appreciate very much from this tool, which is Socratic, as you say, remember Socrates, 
would ask you questions in the market, in the agora, not in, you know, with the Acropolis. And I think that's brilliant. You see, these are the questions where you can interact with the totality. In the market, this is where we can actually take those questions to the everyday commercial decision. You see, so it's a educational tool. It's a conversational, good quality conversational tool. And of course, you know, it's a management tool and a certification tool. You see, so, so it has many, many attributes, for me at least. And those, that tool has been useful for academics to ask the same questions in business schools. You know, Academia B has been created not only for Latin America, it started in Latin America, but now you have professors in all the continents. And, uh, and that was very useful for the cities. You know, the movement that cities can be started in Rio de Janeiro. Earlier, you referred to six legs of yeah. Sistema B. Can you, can you just name the six? In okay, the sorry. So sorry. We, yeah. we don't miss, get passionate. miss out of one of them. <laughs> yeah. Daniel, I get passionate speaking about this. Yeah, mm -hmm. the B Corp community, the large market players uh, with governments, with the governments, large companies and consumers. Then you have the academics, the knowledge building uh, block or community of, of practices. Then you have uh, civil society in general, and, and, and you have many, many movements that are stemming out from that. And then you have the investment world, and then the uh, government as regulator. Mm -hmm. um, so, so these are the six communities. And, and everything that we do includes, you know, we invite, well, at the very beginning, when you start a, a, this model, you start only with big courts. Mm -hmm. but, um, but then you start seeing what, what happens with the others. And, and it's very contagious. Huh? So the systems are being adopted by different communities of people, uh, which are combined, uh, you know, combined multi-stakeholder uh, groupings. Uh, but they find the market as the space for uh, large-scale solutions, social, environmental solutions. Now, personally, I still have the passion for regeneration, the integrated re regeneration. So as a small investor, you know, I push regeneration as an example everywhere. And, and I'm very happy to see that many, many companies are also starting to think regeneration as their own purpose. And regeneration is an integrated notion. It's not only ecological regeneration, because it's, you know, it's the region, regeneration, for example, myself, you know, of my different parts that I had separated in my life, but I now feeling that I have united the bits and pieces which were separate in my mind, obviously, given my context, given my culture, you see? But then when you see Guayaki, for example, when you see the results, you know, Almost 60,000, um, well, 60,000 acres, acres, almost 200,000 acres, no, 60,000 hectares regenerated of, of uh, the South Atlantic forest in Brazil, Argentina, and uh, Paraguay, which were impoverished and they have come back to life. More than a thousand families that are living together with, you know, food sovereignty, uh, with living uh, incomes. Um, but not only with that, with, you know, with empowerment of being themselves. Just one tip there. With the COVID, one of the ethnic groups, the Ache in Paraguay, had produced a harvest of 2,800 kilos uh, with organic food and, you know, vegetables and fruit and donated to the slum dwellers of Asuncion. Wow. You see, there you can see what it means in, in concrete, you see. But then again, going back to Guayaquil as, as a company, I'm not saying it's Guayaquil that actually achieves these results. It's Guayaquil sourcing from indigenous communities, sourcing from campesino communities, cooperatives. You know, mm -hmm. they are the ones who actually are doing that part, you see. Uh, then uh, when you sell the products, of, of you know yerba mate uh, based products in the product uh, markets Canada the U S and Chile then you see that the clients become you know also the, the the stakeholders who actually achieve that solution then you find the investors investors and of course you have all kinds of investors 
and you have the investors, which are the typical impact investors that actually converge the purpose and the solutions with a business model. Mm -hmm. Let me be quite direct. I mean, after six years of investment, uh, and I hope I find it a little bit difficult to say this, but the share value of my shares went up 600%. Now, I never aimed at such a, a difference, you see. It mm -hmm. wasn't my logic, but I'm, I feel comfortable with the idea that in this case, it's not financial speculation. It's basically societal valuation expressed in the value of the shares. This mm -hmm. is what I, 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 I can say. That's a really nice way of saying that, that the switch of the investment mentality that, that, that should occur. Right. Yeah. So, and then you see that, you know, the purpose, the regeneration purpose, the integrated, re the life regeneration purpose of Wayaki, it's a journey because, you know, their carbon footprint was being affected by the, the distribution of the products. So they created a company for distribution and they bought 253 EV bolt vehicles for the last mile, you see? And you know who are the drivers? It's yeah. amazing. Ex-convicts. Ex and, and yeah. 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 And who are the ones who actually communicate the, 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 the results and the purpose of Guayaki? You know, there's no, Guayaki pays from 40 to 60% more the market value to the, to the suppliers, you know, indigenous communities and campesinos. Mm. And they compete with Red Bull. And, and, and how does that happen? Because what happens is that everybody becomes a complice, a positive complice to, mm. for that goal. Yeah. So just imagine 2,000 volunteers, students at university campuses, you know, communicating the same purpose having a concrete example of how you achieve it through the market. And then you have the musicians, you know, the platform come to life music, that you have the musicians communicating the same purpose. So once you start seeing the extent of the infinite that you can reach out just by being a good business for society and the planet, it's very inspiring for so many other thousands of players mm -hmm. in the market. Mm -hmm. So that's why I feel that if you have the examples, you catalyze all the other groups, you see, all the other groups of a system. But if you don't have the example, it could be very theoretical. Mm -hmm. So just like I shared the example of Guayaki, I can also share you the example, many, many other examples of other main industries, restaurant chains with cleaning up oceans or uh, inclusion of, you know, uh, single mothers in the, in the market, in the labor market or special services for the slums or, you know, you have so many purposes, so many purposes as human inner calls, so many purpose as human responses to social or societal needs and planetary needs. So that's the what I'm seeing from everywhere, from government officials, from investors, from academics, from now the accountants are starting to uh, build their own community, um, from lawyers, from the youth, you have the cities that started this movement of cities can be in Rio, and now it's already in Edinburgh and Barcelona, you see. So, so you can see that anything that we can do from anywhere in the world, can be useful for the entire human, humanity. And the economy and the market is one. Mm -hmm. And humanity as well. I, unfortunately, we've only got another five minutes left, but I, I, I'd be interested in, in this networked approach of, um, obviously, you can't build a system like that in, in a relatively short period of time or a network of networks um, across, spanning across an entire, subcontinent and beyond into Europe and, and other places um, without letting go of the notion of having to triple check that every new partner that you work with is doing everything perfectly exactly how you would do it. So you, you need to find very light enabling constraints and basic agreements on how to proceed so a new Sistema B in a new country 
doesn't end up being something completely contradictory to the the mission and um, how do you achieve that building the trust in the network and rolling like expanding the network um and at the same time maintaining some form of quality control that what people do as you let them go they, they call you up and say we're thinking about starting ciudades can be cities can be um how do you how do you make sure that that then is actually something that that you still feel aligned with and that that, that right. is aligned with the impulse yeah daniel excellent question you know when you start you have mous but uh, along the way you start having a legal uh, agreement you see the mous are self-law the legal agreements are you know you can execute them now there's one thing which has been again the pillar we have a licensing agreement Citoyen international has a licensing agreement with b lab and b corps are b corps you see and 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 there's no way benefit corporation the legal status is a benefit corporation throughout the world so we have something similar called sociedades de beneficio interés colectivo it's the same legal language the same legal elements that that's being pushed so we have agreements for that and uh to, to be assured that you know we that's not uh that's not effective in, in its nature regarding sister b we all acknowledge that depending on the context you start in a different pace you see brazil was much more um proactive with the b corps and the large sorry the building the b corp community and especially with the large companies brazil has huge companies and they were very successful there uh other countries started more with the smes but they all start with that and there is a there was an mou and now you start having a much more sophisticated a design of of agreements legal agreements for these new movements and uh and 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 this this is going to be a challenge all the time because suddenly you have an innovation like yesterday two days ago i was speaking to a group of journalists like saying hey we would like to do something similar with the with a, a group of building a community of journalists from throughout the region to to learn together how to be good observant of this i would say the economic position evolution mm -hmm. you know uh, so so call it the economic innovation call it the impact economy but you know there, there are not so many journalists ha that have developed the lenses to be able to com to understand and communicate this i mean i'm speaking about massively yeah. because the logic is for any journalist to be able to communicate this well now the best way of doing it was would be with the leadership of the journalist so this is happening everywhere yesterday i was in a webinar and someone from mexico said hey we should do something for the b educators mm -hmm. at the you know the elementary school and so on but now you're starting the community of the b entrepreneurs you see so so you start this emerging everywhere once you have the systems approach What's beautiful about a system model is that you know that whatever is done by one end of the system will benefit the other end and will synergize with the other end. And of course, it's benefiting not only for inside the system, but it's together for the world and for the planet. So you see, it's so so the achievements of one part are considered the achievements of any of the other parts. You see. So that's the logic of the system approach and of course once you drive this through trade once you have one community here they meet with others here they start trade and it's an impact trade and then if it's from different countries you start having international impact trade so so trade agreements have to do with creating solutions for the other end of the of the trade value chain you see and so on and and this goes on and on it's a it's a beautiful evolutionary experience and, and and so is your journey and thank you so much for this this conversation it's it's really inspiring and and i i i feel that there's more and more wind building in the sails of what you and and collaborators in the sistema b movement have have um like you've set the sails but the wind's definitely blowing in your favor now um the, where everybody is really looking for alternatives and also for alternative recoveries from from the pandem uh, pandemic and yeah. um, I, 
I see like talking to you makes me hopeful and 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 that's uh, that's great because <laughs> there are so many stories on the planet at the moment that, that don't make you hopeful so thank thank you so much yeah. for this conversation and and I hope we can have another one because I don't think this one is finished yet <laughs> thank so. you I'm always available and also talking to you it's like, like always finding bright spots in, 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 in the universe. And, and thank you for the kind of work that you do. Uh, you, you are inspiring you know, thousands, thousands of people all over the world. Wow. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And talk to you soon. Lots of love. All the best, huh? Yeah. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Bye.